Okay, Mr. Marshall, we have Amherst Media in the house. It's 6.31. You do have a quorum of five. Looks like we're good to go. Okay. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of February 15th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, this planning board meeting. Hold on, I just lost my script. This planning board meeting including public hearings will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. <coughs> Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colvin. Yeah. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Uh, I do not see Johanna Newman, and I do not see Karen Winter. Uh, why don't we try to note the time at which they arrive? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Board members, if any technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand <laughs> function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the public comment period is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make <coughs> a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the time is 6.35 and we'll start with our minutes. Um, <laughs> board members, uh, does anyone have comments on the minutes? I know Janet, you had uh, sent some comments to Chris earlier. Would you like to uh, share those with the board? Uh, Janet, you are muted. I can't believe I did that after all these years. Um, Anyway, I one of them was on page four of the minutes where um, there's a statement by Chris Brestrup that the CONCAM hasn't voted yet, and then the statement that they had. And so I think it was that they had, um, but they they hadn't like issued an order yet. So that was a quick one. 
And then there was just this um, kind of loose use of the word townhouse or townhomes and as separate words. And I just thought we should just call it townhouse as one word, which is how we do it in the bylaw. And that kind of pops up all over the place. But because I was kind of confused by it and I was like, what are townhomes? And I was thinking like motor homes and stuff like that. So it's just really, that's a small one. All right. Uh, <clears throat> anybody else have other comments? Anybody have any objections to the edits that uh, Dan is suggesting? All right. Um, not seeing any other hands. Uh, would anybody like to move that the minutes with the edits that Janet pr uh, proposed be adopted? Andrew, I see your hand. So moved. Thank you. And Tom? On second. All right. Thank you both. All right, we'll go right into a vote on that, uh, starting with Bruce. Uh, vote to approve. Great. Tom? Aye. And Andrew? Aye. Janet? Aye. I'm an aye as well. <clears throat> so the motion passes, five in favor, two absent. All right, so now the time is 638 and we'll go to item two on our agenda, which is public comment period. And uh, let's see how, how many people have we got from the public tonight. We've got, I see six people. Um, I think I often uh, read their names at this time so they know who else is in the public. Uh, we have Ashley Lawrie, Bruce Carson, Dorothy Pam, Jennifer Taub, Mandy Jo Haneke and Will Laurie. So members of the public, would any of you like to make a public comment about an item not on our agenda tonight at this time? All right, I am not seeing any hands from the public. So we, oh, and uh, I believe Elizabeth Veerling just arrived. Uh, Elizabeth, we are in the public comment period. If you want to make a public comment about something not on our agenda, this is the time to raise your hand. All right, I don't see anyone's hand still, so we will go on to the next item on our agenda, which is item three, proposed zoning amendments. And uh, this is a presentation and discussion really mostly um, of the zoning amendment proposals proposed by Mandy Jo Haneke and Pat DeAngelis uh, concerning Article 3 use regulations to change the permitting requirements for owner occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes, non owner occupied du duplexes, converted dwellings, and townhouses in order to create a more streamlined permitting pathway for these uses. In particular, <coughs> to remove the use category subdividable dwellings, to add a use category three family detached dwelling or triplex, to add a permitting pathway and standards and conditions for triplexes, to modify standards and conditions for other housing use categories, to amend permitting requirements for, for housing use categories in the aquifer recharge protect, protection overlay district, and then in article four development methods to add three family dwelling where appropriate, in Article 9, non-conforming lots, uses and structures to add a reference to three-family dwelling, and under Article 12, definitions to add three-family detached dwelling unit or triplex and to delete subdividable dwellings. All right, um, so Mandy Jo, I see you. Uh, if you want to say anything, this is a good time to give us an intro. I know you've been here before and uh, maybe you want to just sit back and listen. I do understand that you are hoping uh, the board will come out of this evening's discussion with a clearer sense, at least, of our of, of what we like about the proposal and would support, and uh, you know, and thereby what we don't like and don't support. So, uh, at least that's my understanding of what we have as our task this evening. Mandy Joe. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. Um, I, I'm not going to say much. I've we've done a presentation 
for two different meetings. I think, you know, I'm, I'm here to answer some questions. I do have to leave at 715 and Pat could not be here tonight for a number of reasons and she sends her regrets. Um, I will listen to the meeting, the rest of the meeting that I have to miss um, once I leave. But yeah, I, I think Pat and I are hoping to, you know, we know it's not the public hearing. We know the public hearing's coming up and that as we go through the public hearing process, there are likely to be changes. Um, but throughout this meeting and the public hearing process, it would be good for us to be able to get an understanding of particularly those parts of the proposal that um, the board as a whole or as a majority um, would like to see changes to, potentially with what those changes might be. Um, where they are leaning um, so that we can discuss it as sponsors and potentially come back with revisions and all um, based on, on those comments. But, but we'd really like to understand um, not just whether one person wants a change, but whether the body as a whole is seeking a potential change or, or wants that because that helps us more. Um, it's good to hear what each individual person, person is thinking, but as a whole, since you'll be voting as a whole, that's that's where we would really like some help. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions. All right, thank you. All right, uh, board members, uh, we've had this is our third meeting at which we've discussed this proposal, and uh, I don't know if you are feeling that you've got a sense of what you like or what you don't like. This is the time to start talking about that. Um, I guess to kick things off and not seeing any hands yet from others, I'll I'll just say what I like and uh, what I'll, I'll, and and one concern that I have. Um, <clears throat> I uh, actually uh, think that we should try this uh, in the RG and the RVC zoning mm -hmm. districts. Uh, those districts that are adjacent to our town centers and village centers, and that we should hold off and maybe, you know, for a, for a later date, if ever, uh, doing this in some of the outlying districts, the, uh, I think it's the RN and the RO and RLD. Uh, someone is not. Yep, I, I took care of that. Okay. Karen, Karen's in the audience, isn't it? And her hand is raised. Just, I'm sorry, Doug, just to jump in. Oh, yeah, okay. Pam, can you move her over? Yep, I'm in the process. All right, good. So, yeah, I, I feel like uh, I would like to see more density and more housing in areas that the master plan calls for us to be increasing housing and density and building up. Um, and that uh, increasing the density in, in some of the outlying areas is, is akin to sprawl, um, and um, I'd rather not go in that direction. Um, if there's a, a desire to do it in the RN district, that, that district has a lot of different characteristics depending on where in that district you are. Um, so it, it, I would be willing to consider that in, in some proximity to major public roads that are served by buses, for instance. Uh, and the, the roads that came to mind initially were North Pleasant Street, South Pleasant Street, West Street down to Bay Road and Northampton Road. And there may be others, uh, but you know, say within say a thousand feet of that, of those roads. Um, and then the only other thing I was gonna say is I'm a little bit concerned about the how a property might transition between an owner-occupied duplex to a non-owner-occupied duplex. And the fact that we would be in the position of having to hold a public, a site plan review uh, on a duplex that was already approved for owner-occupancy in order to grant non-owner-occupancy, but the thing's already built, the landscape's already done, and what kind of leverage or flexibility would we have to actually influence the design of the duplex at that point when it was proposed to go to non-owner occupancy? So, you know, I mean, the easy thing would be to say that both owner and non-owner occupied duplexes should have a site plan review. 
uh, up front before they happen. Um, I, I, I realize that's probably not in the spirit of what you've proposed, what you want to do, but I'm, I don't know how else to deal with that. Um, so I, I will leave that as a question. Um, and, um, you know, maybe it's best that we just go forward with the way you've proposed it and see, get through a couple of them and see what happens. But uh, I think that could be a, an uncomfortable position for the board. All right, so that's, that's my thought. Um, and uh, to Tom, I see your hand. Sure, thanks, Doug. I had uh, a similar thought um, and, and it was similar zones, but I think you had the right ones. Um, sort of now that I'm looking at it and actually the context of the road, but I think the idea of testing this in a, in a certain set of areas that we outline as places we want to see growth um, and then getting data. And I think the thing that I'm missing from all of these presentations is data. So how do we know that it builds equity? How do we know that it's going to improve X, Y, or Z, make things cheaper, make things more affordable? How do we know any of these things without actually testing this out in our town? Um, so I'd love to see a controlled test within certain zones. Um, and I'd like to see some data from that before we push it out to other areas. And maybe we even have data that tells us we should actually put it in this zone and not that zone. And maybe we actually find out some information that would be helpful for us to deploy this in a more um, strategic way. Uh, not that I don't think, Mandy, Joe, that this is strategic, but in, in a way that um, is responding to data uh, on the ground. So that would be my sense. And I think that Doug's um, notion of the zones to begin testing um, sound appropriate to me. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, other board members, uh, this is the time for input. Uh, all right, I see Janet and then Andrew. Janet? So I, I agree with what Tom is saying and um, Doug is saying about the um, RN, RLD, and RO, because you know, when you know, even though this is sort of presented as a process or a change in process or um, permitting, there's a lot of added density in it. If you look at how it will turn out. And I was looking, I have the benefit of this huge map of Amherst and its zoning districts. And, you know, I was looking at the RO and RLD, which is basically a mostly, almost exclusively our open land that you see. And also then we have townhouses in there you know, 10 townhouses on, you know, X amount of acres. And I see, I would just start seeing in my mind carved, you know, farms being carved up for very lucrative housing, you know, three-story townhouses, 10 townhouses, um, or lots being divided to, you know, kind of spawn those. And that just seems to be the essence of sprawl, sprawl and also goes against the whole master plan of having density in the village centers and protecting, you know, the lands that we're trying to protect. Um, and so I, I do think those should be taken off the table. Um, I So I I was concerned, I have some, many concerns. I also was concerned about the removal of all sorts of design standards for duplexes, for converted dwellings. And it's, you know, I think we definitely need more design standards. Um, our master plan calls for that. Um, you know, we've been trying to get to that even for the town center, but, you know, the idea that, we're we're taking away statements like it should fit into the neighborhood or you know all these different things that would give a board or anybody the ability to kind of look at a project and say you know look at the impact it has on the adjacent properties and things like that so that those get lifted off in several spots so I was concerned about that um so I I don't think we should be lifting design controls and abilities of boards to kind of regulate the look or the impact on um, the surrounding area. Um, I don't think, you know, and one of the things I began to under, think about is townhouses are apartment buildings, right? There are 10, you know, 10 units, they're stuck together. And I don't understand why the logic of treating them differently, apartment buildings and townhouses differently. Like why would you permit apartment? We don't permit apartment buildings in RN. So why would we permit townhouses in RN? We don't permit apartments in RLD and RO. So why would we permit them there? And then also, you know, in the RG neighborhoods, we allow townhouses, 
but we do it by special permit because it's very dense and it's going to have big impacts and we need a board to look at what the impacts are very carefully and have the ability to kind of put in the conditions and the controls that make sure that it fits into the neighborhood it doesn't have a negative impact and you know i want i think the board should start looking about at who's living in these you know who's going to be living in the density and how do we prevent you know one neighborhood after another to kind of turning into a student neighborhood. Um, and so but we need more controls on that, not fewer controls. So I think we should um, kind of trust the boards to do the right thing, but really think about, you know, if we're gonna do analogies, is a townhouse is an apartment building side by side. And if we're saying no apartments somewhere, why are we saying yes to townhouses? Or if we're saying apartments by special permit, that should also be true for, for townhouses. All right, thank you, Janet. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, I, I uh, wanted to add a couple small comments. I I came out of the last meeting thinking that, um, you know, being very happy with what I was seeing, but hearing from, you know, my peers that uh, some sort of phasing would would make sense. And I, I wasn't really sure what would be a good way. I think, Doug, your, your proposal, it's a pretty logical one. Um, and something that I could support um, if we let you know limit it to certain zones. Um, I guess another point I'd make just in the vein that Tom had mentioned uh, getting data is I, I I'm it's not really clear to me how much this is going to affect existing construction or new construction, whether this is really going to drive kind of more conversions, people you know redesigning their existing house, in which case the impacts to the to the character might be minimal versus new construction where, you know, there could be some significant change and, you know, to Janet's point around making sure that we have some, um, some, some guidelines around design, uh, I think would be important for those new buildings, especially um, if it is limited to areas where we already have densification or density rather, then I suspect it's going to be more of the conversions, in which case, uh, probably less of an impact. On design, so you know, if we do phase it where we start in that area, that would give us time to think through some of the design standards, and maybe we can kind of roll this in. Um, I, I'm also, though, you know, as I think about limiting the the scope of, we'll just call it a pilot, for lack of a better term, here is that, you know, is that going to affect any change in the near term, right? If we if we identify areas to focus in on, and there really just aren't the opportunities either for new construction or conversion, are we just kind of kicking this can down the road a little bit longer and, and haven't introduced any new housing? So overall, still very positive, still feel, feel very good about what's happening here. And I think, um, you know, what's been proposed by some of my peers already um, is, is, I think, a really step in the right direction. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Bruce, you're next. Um, I'm uh, broadly supportive of most of what's been said. Specifically, I think, uh, Doug, I, I'm, I'm more supportive of the notion in the two districts that you mentioned. Um, and I'm uh, certainly supportive of uh, Tom's uh, and Andrew's uh, sense that we need some evidence that uh, what is being proposed will actually achieve the goals because as i said last week i really don't see how that can possibly it doesn't feel like it's uh, going to happen to me it seems that just increasing the housing supply isn't going to um, first and foremost uh, provide us with uh, additional workforce housing uh, I think it's it's more likely to go into uh, the uh, uh, into the student home market, and uh, and that would make me less supportive of this if I thought that that was the uh, the primary uh, um, slice section of the market that was going to be uh, expanded here. I like the goals of this, but I just don't I can't I can't I don't have evidence that uh, that those goals are going to be achieved by what's being proposed. Therefore, as with Tom and Andrew, I'd like uh, I, I would like to see a, a, a some introductory uh, phased um, in, uh, uh, way of introducing this and, and testing it and, and 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 seeing if it can be demonstrated that the objectives will be met. Uh, that's important. I uh, 
I support Janet's uh, observations about um, that the RL, RO and RLD are probably the least uh, 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 preferable candidates for this this change. Um, and, and finally, um, the one thing that I might add that uh, hasn't been said is that I'm more broadly supportive of uh, uh, making uh, duplexes, owner-occupied duplexes and affordable duplexes, uh, um, uh, uh, elevating them to a by right uh, status. I, I, I think I could be persuaded that uh, that would be uh, uh, functional because I think that the... Uh, because I think that with those two housing types, the objectives that are uh, being stated are more likely to be met. Um, so that I think is uh, really where I stand. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Tom. Thanks, Doug. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'll, I'll start with a question and I think it has some relevance to how we might think about deploying this as well. And, and that is, do any of these homes with, I, I've read through them, but I'm, I, can't, I can't be quite sure, whether a duplex, triplex, townhouse, apartment building, do any of these have uh, a discrepancy or have a distinction of being rented or owned? Um, and my sense is that I would probably support buildings built to be owned in certain zones versus uh, rented in certain zones. And I think the condition of how it will be, how one, uh, whether ownership is our goal or whether more rentals is our goal, again, will determine who the end user is and where that affordable housing um, for, or let's say starter homes um, could be deployed in certain zones. So. I, maybe you can answer the question is there any stipulation about how they can be used and do we or whether it will be owned or rented and do we have any say over that uh mandy that's a question i think for you um so certainly there is for duplexes right there are three use categories there is an owner occupied use category um and at least the definition is at least one of those units in that duplex must be owner occupied and it must be recorded on the proposal is that it must be recorded on the deed at the Hampshire Registry of Deeds. Um, the second use category is affordable duplex. That does not require an owner occupancy requirement for either of the two units, but it does require that at least one of those units be listed on the state housing inventory for affordable housing. And, and also that that be listed on a deed. So um, in those two instances, so for duplexes, there are three different uses proposed yeah. well they're already in the bylaw and we're yeah. proposing different um permitting pathways depending on which category of duplex there is um we did not do that with triplexes um we just proposed one we have received some feedback from the housing trust that they would be supportive of splitting triplexes up in the same way that duplexes are split up mm -hmm. in terms of an owner occupied triplex a affordable triplex and a non owner occupied triplex. Mm -hmm. um, and this, Pat and I have not formal, formally talked about that yet, um, but we'd like to hear your response and thoughts on potentially splitting those up too. Um, my understanding is for converted dwellings and um, townhomes, the zoning bylaw is neutral on the ownership um, of those, but Chris would better be able to state and confirm that. All right, thanks, Mandy Jo. <clears throat> Chris, do you want to comment on that or not? You just, just, to, just to, it sounds like what Mandy Jo is accurate. It's neutral on the ownership. I believe so. Okay. But is there, so there is no way for us to, for instance, within a particular zone, say it would be okay to build a, a, a set of townhouses if they were meant to be purchased by the owners rather than rented. And, and I think that's what I'm getting at in terms of the, the difference between whether we're building a bunch of rentals or we're building actual homes, small duplex or um, let's say townhouse 
homes that people would would own, like a condo or or whatnot. And and is there any way for us to make a, a stipulation about what happens in each zone? I think that's kind of what I'm getting at. Chris? Generally speaking, the zoning bylaw doesn't get into ownership issues or rental issues. Um, it's very rare that it does. And we did dip our toe into that when we established owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied duplexes. But otherwise, we don't really recognize whether someone um, owns a place or rents a place. Certainly, um, townhouses can be developed as condominiums, and we have several examples of that in town. And we have um, examples of townhouses being developed as rental property and then turning into condos. So that's kind of a fluid situation. But there's a not um, usually a requirement that something like that be owner occupied or non owner occupied. It's certainly something we could explore with our uh, town attorney and see how how far we could get. I mean, another way to think about it would be if we essentially reduced the dimensional requirements for what would turn into row houses. You know, you own your row house, but you're, you're you know, 16 or 24 feet of width and by a hundred feet depth deep or whatever. And, um, you know, you, there's one unit per lot and, uh, and they just happen to all share party walls. So that's another typology that's similar to townhouses, but yeah. uh, is clearly owner occupied or at least one owner per structure. Yeah, I mean, my that, that's that's interesting, Doug. I mean, I think my my concern there is, you know, how do we start to imagine who the end user will be, right? And we're talking about certain zones, and can we control who those end users might be by saying, if someone is, if we're asking people to buy something, we're building a community. If we're asking them to rent it, it's going to be someone that's going to turn over, which doesn't mean that they can't buy it and then rent it later. But <laughs> I guess I guess I'm just I'm just curious if they're, you know. If right. That could be something we can think about as, as time goes on. All right, Tom, uh, Janet. I think this is a great discussion because one of my you know questions was how do we make space in Amherst for middle and low income residents, you know, given the intense student housing demand plus you know the the prices that you know students or their parents are paying. Um, and also builders will build to the higher end of the market almost always, right? So, you you know, you're going to make more money on an $800,000 house than a $400,000 house. So I think the idea of um, giving some more, um, an easier permitting path when you know that the um, converted dwelling or the townhouse is going to be owner occupied would create, would assuage or alleviate a lot of the concerns of people in the RG that they're just, you know, basically, you know, kind of you know, getting house by house is, is slowly turning into, you know, a student housing neighborhood and people are leaving. And so I think that's an interesting idea. I just wanted to make a quick note that both on subdividable dwellings and converted dwellings, they do talk about owner um, occupancy as a factor. Um, and, you know, like with the converted dwellings, you know, it says the proposed conversion shall be suitably located in the neighborhood in which it's proposed. Um, the conversion, if it's in a residential district, shall either be located in an area close to heavily traveled streets, close to business, um, blah, 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 um, and, and shall require owner occupancy or a resident matter manager in one of the units. And then it goes on. So that that issue pops up in both of those. And, you know, I think I think this also, you know, I, one of my questions was, what is the history and the purpose of these kind, this language or these restrictions, or, you know, why did town meeting or the planning department or the select board, why did they pick this permitting pathway? Um, and we don't have any history of why in the RG we need a special permit for a duplex, you know, but that history is there and I feel like we need that data. Um, I also think we need to have renderings if, if we're, you know, saying, you know, triplexes that are, you know, stacked in three stories, not a triplex actually in a, in a two and a half story building. I don't really care how it gets configured. You know, what could that look like? Or what would, you know, so we don't have renderings of what can be built now and what could be built under the new proposals because there is a change in density in a lot of the proposals. Um, but I do think that we need some kind of guardrails to make sure that we're keeping space for 
you know, regular folk, like middle and low income families or individuals that, you know, if we're building a townhouse or we're building, you know, a converted dwelling with an easier permitting path that we know that there's going to be space. And I actually think we could say no more than, you know, 40 or 50 percent can be rented to students and making sure that whatever you build or convert, there's always space for non-students in a neighborhood because that builds better community and kind of keeps the balance a little bit more. Um, so, that, but I, I do like the idea of like, how can we, you know, make sure that the zoning change leads to the housing that we want. And I am hoping that we have some examples of other college towns that have dealt with this. I know we're all grappling with the same thing. Some research saying, oh, you know, Ann Arbor did this, you know, so-and-so did that, or no, did this. I, I just feel like we're not really, we just need some more information about and about what actually worked and what were the impacts and not just hopes that it's gonna work out. All right, thank you, Janet. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'm gonna make a couple of comments. One is, um, you know, Janet, uh, your suggestion that we need more data or examples or renderings. Um, you know, obviously we don't have the resources to bring those uh, for the staff to, to bring those kinds of things to the conversation. And we have a, a firm proposal on the table, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have to deal with now. So uh, if you are able to find any data like that and you want to have that available for your consideration, I think it's really incumbent on, on each of us to do whatever we think we need to do in order to be able to decide how to vote on these things. Um, I guess the other thing I'll say is that we have, we have multiple problems in this town. We have a shortage of student housing and we have a shortage of uh, middle income and worker housing. And I think uh, we, we can't solve the second one without somehow dealing with the first one. And I feel like we're so far behind on providing housing for the students in this town that it could actually be a while before we see improvement in the worker housing and middle income housing availability uh, just because there's so many students that, that are un, unmet, you know, their, their demands are unmet. Uh, there's houses being constructed in Hadley and East Hampton and Belchertown, just because of the fact that we haven't got all the students would like to be here in town, but they're not able to be. So, um, you know, I think, I, I don't think we will be able to target the housing as easily as we want. And, but I, I guess I always feel like more housing at the moment is better than no, less housing or no more housing, just because more housing will solve one or the other of those problems and both need to be solved. All right, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, so, you know, I've been, I kind of wrestle with the, the home ownership versus the rental component, um, because um, you know just buying a house is really expensive as well, right? So, like if if we say, well, let's let's try to put some controls to require these things to be owner occupied, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to open up housing for you know um, workforce uh, populations because they can't afford it. Um, I'm also wondering, you know, the same way um, the same way that we approach um, you know, providing housing units for low and moderate income people in apartments. You know, we've we've talked about the importance and you know just science in general, the importance of having um, these communities, you know, together. And um, so, an idea just popped in my head. It's probably not a good one, but you know, what if what if the answer is just no more than one unit can be student housing, right? And then like. If we do that, then perhaps we're forcing more, um, you know, more kind of cohabitation. But you know, it might um, then provide some actual avenues for us to meet the needs of workforce as well as student. Um, so anyhow, I hadn't really thought through that too much, but it did seem like that could be a simple way around this um, of just 
um, providing the limit on that side. Don't worry about owner or renter um, occupied. The, if the idea is just to try to get more housing in general, um, it can be approached that way. So thanks. All right. All right. Um, Mandy, Joe, I know you, you may be close to the time you need to leave. Uh, the conversation started out with sounding kind of like a consensus, and then it's sort of devolved and, and spread out further. Um, it, I think my current, off the top of my head, uh, perception is that we're more supportive of uh, implementing something like what you are proposing in the RG and RBC districts. Uh, we're less interested in it in the outlying districts farther, farther out. Um, and uh, there's a lot of conversation about duplexes and how they get, how they get dealt with and, and, and triplexes. So um, I don't know if we can actually legislate student rentals and non-student rentals, but uh, there's clearly some interest in that. I will say that by limiting the number of student rentals in any one area, we are probably spreading the students around further into around Amherst rather than having them concentrated in a zone. And um, you know, some towns have a student area and all the students live there and then everybody else is further away from them and can live in more uh, quiet and peace. <laughs> uh, and then some, some towns may distribute them more and then they're they're more of a presence throughout the town all right so i see three hands from board members uh mandy why don't you go ahead before if you're about to leave yeah thank you i do have to leave soon i just wanted this is a great conversation and it is quite helpful um and i hope it will continue even though i'm going to have to leave i will watch the video unfortunately i won't be able to respond to anything or answer any questions after i leave but i did want to respond to a couple things and correct a couple of things um, we have not actually removed the language um, regarding um, surrounding neighborhoods within our duplex category. We still have in there that two family detached dwellings or three family detached dwellings shall have an external appearance and footprint compatible in terms of design with those of single family dwellings in the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, with converted dwellings, we've put in a requirement that they have to meet the standards for their most close use. So if a converted dwelling would go to a two family, it would still have that standard for three families have that standard in there. I didn't have time to, you know, and so that compatibility is still in um, most of the uses, if not all of them. Um, uh, we talked about the owner occupied requirements for duplexes. Um, I want to address the RN issue. Um, Doug mentioned that RN is um, quite diverse. Um, Janet indicated that apartments aren't allowed. Yes, in the use category, on the use table, apartments aren't allowed. But in fact, the RN zone is probably the zone that has the most apartments in town um, in building wise, because the RN zone is where Puffton is. It's where Brandywine is. It's um, everything off of East Hadley Road is in RN. So despite the use table saying they're not allowed, they are actually quite prevalent in the RN zone. Um, so that's one of the reasons we believe they're appropriate in the RN zone, that townhouses are appropriate. I would say townhouses are different than apartments. Yes, they might have sometimes similar numbers of units, um, but townhomes must have entrances at the ground floor for every unit, which makes it a great transitional type of housing between that more dense apartment mixed use building and the less, less dense three families, two families and single family homes because all units have entrances on the ground floor. Um, density. Uh, in fact, we're not really increasing density in most of this. The only place where we would technically be increasing any density is if you're changing a no use to some other use, because a no use doesn't allow it. And so changing that no to a special permit you could argue increases density, but if it's a if it's already a site plan review, changing it to a yes, there's no change in allowable density because it's already allowed. Um, you could argue that changing from a special permit to a site plan review, we could argue whether or not it changes density, but we're not changing the dimensional tables at all. We haven't proposed that. And so if the use is already allowed, either by special permit site plan or site plan review, the density is not changing, I would say. It's only in those places we've proposed 
going from no, where that use is not allowed, to some other permitting pathway. Um, I haven't heard much about the business zone proposals, so I think some thoughts on that, because we're talking a lot about the residential sides, would be helpful just to give Pat and I some guidance. There are some changes proposed to the BL, BVC, and BN sections. So just, just a thought, if you guys want to talk about that, it would be helpful for us to hear that. Um, and I would actually like to hear a little bit more about potentially about the design guidelines that people are aiming for, particularly with respect to duplexes, um, as compared to single family homes and why duplexes should not be treated the same as single family homes with respect to design guidelines. Um, that's the, the way Pat and I approached this. And so just saying we need them, we'd like to hear more about that thought comparing them to a single family home because we do not have any design stands guidelines for single family homes. And I don't hear anyone thinking about putting them in. Um, so those are just some of my responses to things I heard. Um, other things that would be helpful for us to um, hear about um, as you continue this discussion. I'm sorry I can't stay any longer, but I promise I will listen to this once it is posted. And Pat and I, when we come back for the hearing, we'll try and um, change, you know, pre our presentation will try to address a number of these and potentially may have changes based on these conversations. So I thank you for that. I hope it continues to go very well. And I'm sorry I do have to leave though. All right. Thank you, Mandy Joe. <laughs> All right, the next hand is Bruce's. Oh, um, I was going to respond to you, Doug, uh, a little bit. Andy Joe's put a lot of things in the air, um, but I'm going to try to uh, ignore that, except for the design guidelines for uh, duplexes and so forth, which if I recall, I'll, I'll finish with. But um, I recall you said that uh, um, where to start here? I, I I'm uh, I'm I'm concerned, uh, uh, as I've said, about uh, whether the goals will be uh, 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 materialized. And Andrew uh, said uh, that, and Tom have said um, uh, uh, some kind of uh, attention to the density of, uh, of of student housing or student rentals or houses that have, 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 are student occupied. Um, it could be a, a useful um, addition to this. And and uh, I've got to say that this is where I've really been putting a lot of my time this past week or, or two. Um, it seems to me that having a definition of a student home, uh, a, a use that is actually defined, uh, would make it possible to do that. And, and, uh, and I've, uh, and, 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 um, in con consistent with what you said earlier, Doug, about if, if, if we, sh we, we should not expect to rely on a very short-staffed uh, uh, town hall to uh, get us the answers to some of the questions we feel we need in order to make whatever decision we need to make on this. So accordingly, I've decided to put a lot of effort into trying to understand this. Um, and um, I'll probably speak more about this once I've done the work, but I'm, I'm gearing up to uh, find out as much as I can from uh, what I might identify as being the, the 12 or 15 most uh, similar communities to Amherst around the country, and then talking to people in those communities and, and uh, getting answers to, uh, I don't know, eight or a dozen questions that I'm gradually refining. So I'm going to, I'm committing to doing that. And I, and part of the, uh, um, why I want to do that is, Andrew, what you just said about what I guess are called minimum distance requirements or density of student uh, accommodations, also defining what we mean by that. And uh, so I, I'm I'm going to do what I can to help uh, certainly myself and perhaps others uh, by gathering these data and uh, and uh, and making it available. Um, uh, the the uh, the question about design standards with duplexes and so forth, I've always found rather interesting because uh, when we were designing our co-housing community here, it was around duplexes. That's how we got the density that we needed. So we basically went through just a string of special permits. Um, 
and uh, and what I personally then was quite concerned about was that these duplexes should not look like duplexes, and uh, and what the way we've done it here is we've made them basically attached cottages, and we've used a <coughs> common entry to link two small uh, masses, and so it's a duplex, but it doesn't look like a duplex. Um, secondly, when with Habitat, I was designing uh, the uh, house that's next to the farmhouse on North Pleasant Street. Uh, there's a Habitat house uh, duplex there. Um, in order to make it fit well, uh, the design was a two-story and a single story. So it looks like one big house. It looks actually quite similar to the house next door, which is the NECF, the Simple Gifts uh, farmhouse. But um, So that's another way. Uh, which you might say a design standard of creating a duplex out of a single story unit and a two story unit. It, it, uh, it, it, but when you have two two story units which are right next to each other with a common roof line and two doors in the middle, and it's a simple block mass, that's a, a, when I think duplexes start to look clumsy. And so I think it is true that we can, uh, even amongst ourselves, probably generate some design guidelines that would uh, create more agreeable duplexes, particularly in, in zones where there are single family houses. So I, I support the idea of doing that, but I think that's uh, um, always been our intention, hasn't it? To maybe not throughout town, but to create design guidelines that will help boards like ours make uh, better decisions. So I like that idea as well, although I'm not present committing to doing that for all of these units. I did think Mandy Joe's answer to the townhouse question, Janet, was a was a good one. The uh, uh, the idea that the townhouse is defined by having doors, it, uh, it, it they become more like row houses, more more urban in quality and so forth, but diminished in scale because they have to always have an entry and have a, a presence on the street. Right, I thanks, think that's uh, enough for me. I'm excited to see what you what you find out from your research and your your other work. Janet, you are next. This is probably where we would be useful to have someone from the ZBA here because um, they're the ones who are doing all the duplexes, right? And so in in the um, in the um, use chart, there it requires that um, in all districts a special permit granting authority, shall apply the provisions of section 3.2040 and 3.2041. And this should get Tom's attention because these are the standards the, the design review board applies in um, the downtown district. And so that's what the ZBA is applying to duplexes. And I actually, that language is stripped out by these amendments. And so, um, and then the language in converted dwellings that has more extensive kind of design guidelines is also stripped out and then we just lose subdividable dwellings completely. So I would think that, um, you know, there, there are duplexes in my neighborhood that look just like houses and you kind of have to kind of look to see that they are. So I assume that the ZBA is applying these um, design review standards. And I would suggest that they should apply to all multifamily houses. Um, you know, so it, it always should look good. It always should fit in to a neighborhood. So, and I think it actually, by requiring it to fit in and look good, like it belongs in the neighborhood, you're going to create a lot more acceptance of multi-unit housing. And so if, you know, I think that the people who do this best are, um, um, I can't, I, I always forget the group, um, Valley CDC, who's building um, a lot of affordable units around Northampton and Amherst, I think their housing fits in better than most of the other for-profit <laughs> buildings I've seen going around because they're very sensitive. And I've heard um, people in the housing trust, one of the a person who creates a lot of housing say they really make a huge effort to make sure it looks good and fits in the neighborhood because they know they're going to have opposition and they know they're increasing density. So they want to fit into sort of a New England style of housing. So I really think we should leave that language into duplexes. And if we are gonna expand, we should apply it to any multifamily housing. So we have a clear, consistent, give the boards a chance or, you know, to basically say, you know, we're fine on this, you know, four unit converted dwelling, but it, it we have to make it so it fits in and doesn't look like just a big concrete block or your addition is kind of ugly and stuff like that. We do have language sort of a, pared down for ADUs, 
So I, I think my recommendation is let's take, you know, section 3.2040 and just apply it to all multi-unit housing. And I think people will feel better about what's being built. They'll feel better about the density and they'll know that their concerns are being addressed, which the, the ZBA does really well with their special permits. They listen to the neighborhoods, neighbors, they make adjustments, they make accommodations, and they issue permits. Um, I have a question for Chris about affordable duplexes, because when I look at this, um, you know, the current um, use table, I kind of wonder, like, is anyone building an affordable duplex? Because it just, I mean, have any, like how many have been built in the last five years? Are people building owner-occupied duplexes, you know, or how many owner-occupied duplexes have been converted to an owner-occupied ones? Go ahead, it's All hard right, to see. Um, so the primary builders of, owner, of affordable duplexes um, is Habitat, Habitat for Humanity. They've built two um, affordable duplexes, uh, one on East Pleasant Street and one on North Pleasant Street, one that um, Bruce was just referring to. Mm -hmm. um, it's unlikely, in my opinion, that um, a single person owning a house would build an affordable duplex because, well, it depends on what his motivation is. If, his, if he's motivated to house, you know, humanity, then he may in fact, want to build an affordable duplex, but most people build houses because they want to make money, either by renting them or by selling them. And so um, building an affordable duplex would not provide um, the developer with a lot of money. So really, um, I would say affordable duplexes are primarily for institution institutions like Habitat for Humanity. Um, the other thing is for an affordable duplex, if if it were actually going to be affordable capital A, it would have to be on the uh, state um, SHI, the housing inventory. And um, it takes a lot of effort to get um, a unit on the housing inventory. There's a lot of paperwork. And um, if you're really interested in getting into this, Nate Malloy is here and he can tell you all about that. But um, we personally think that Nate and I believe that um, the average person is not going to want to um, en engage in that. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, uh, Bruce. I think maybe Chris has uh, uh, bulldozed over what I, but all I was going to say that I heard from Mandy Joe tonight something which clarified a lot of things a little for me, which was that only one of the two units needed to be affordable in order to. Uh, to uh, make it uh, uh, defined as such uh, within this bylaw, or at least proposed change. So I agree with most of what she's, all of what Chris says, but it is possible that somebody might decide to uh, to uh, create one side affordable for whatever reason, and one of those reasons might be just in order to make it a buy right thing without having to go through the rigmarole. So, but I, but uh, so that was useful for me to register that. And I thought, do I care about that? And I thought, no, that still fits my my sense of comfort with a buy right. But it did it did change the notion because I thought, as Chris did, that uh, that an affordable duplex was always going to be a habitat thing, and it's such a low volume, and it really is it's 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 the least consequential of uh, the proposed changes. But it does step it up a little bit just with that potential wrinkle. But it's a wrinkle, if I understand it correctly, that doesn't make it, uh, it, it uh, I retain my view that uh, a by right uh, uh, allocation for that in any zone is okay at the moment. All right, thanks, Bruce. I, I'm gonna channel uh, Mandy Joe a little bit in response to Janet, to your comment about the design guidelines for duplexes. Um, I think one of their purposes was to try to remove obstacles to the creation of duplexes and treat them more like single family homes. And so I think they that's the reason that they were proposing that they just become a yes, rather than a site plan review that's going to need a lot of uh, process and registry of deed registration and uh, an application of the design guidelines. I guess as a sort of intellectual uh, exercise, I could ask, 
well, why don't we have design guidelines apply to single family homes? If I want to build a single family home in an existing neighborhood, don't the neighbor concerns about scale and, you know, massing and uh, siting, all, all of those still apply to a neighbor. And so why wouldn't we just do that all the time? Um, and nobody needs to answer that, but I think that's, that's kind of a, a reasonable question to be asking about why do, when do we really want to do that? All right, uh, Janet, I'll, I'll call on you. And I do know that there is one hand from the public that's been up for a while. So Tara Laraha, um, I will be calling on you after Janet. Go ahead, Janet. So she said that there wasn't any um, lowering of design guidelines. And so I was correcting that. And um, I think it'd be interesting to see what the ZBA does with that. And there's a few other sections of the amendments that strip off language about design controls. I understand what you're saying about single family homes, but I think that, you know, there's, we want to encourage multifamily housing in Amherst. We want it to fit in. We don't want to have neighborhoods overrun by students. And what's, how do we get there? And so we've all talked about some suggestions about reserving space for people. Um, but I think that, you know, a duplex that is attractive and looks good. I mean, I think we've had a fair amount of those happening and no one notices them. And I think if it's a triplex or a quadplex or a converted dwelling or a subdividable dwelling um, or a townhouse, it all should look good. We don't have, you know, we don't apply the design review board criteria to townhouses. I think we should. I mean, we need design controls. And so I think we should encourage that. I don't think they're onerous. And I think it's easy to do, especially with the duplex. But Mandy Jo was saying, oh, we're not changing that. And she's also saying we're not changing density. And yet when RO and RLD, she was there, even though it's in the use table, there's requirements for extra units that you have to have either a thousand, you know, extra square feet or 2000. And those got removed also. So there's a lot of like complexity to this and the impacts are, you know, we can document them and show them. I don't particularly feel like I have to present renderings, but I really think people need to see what will it look like? What could it look like to have a 10 unit townhouse in the middle of a field, you know, with a driveway going up, you know, in the RO or the RLD. If someone is proposing that, I think the burden is on Pat and Mandy Joe to show that's what it's going to look like. Um, you know, I think we're probably have a consensus that we don't think that is that density is appropriate for these lands, but I do think, you know, what does it look like? Because that's had an impact um, on, you know, things that we've looked at before in the BL. When you looked at the calculations and you did the picture, it was kind of like, oh, that's much more than what we wanted. Footnote M is the same situation. So if we're increasing density or reducing requirements, what is it going to look like? is a pretty fair question for buildings. All right, thanks, Janet. All right, so I will now go to the public. Um, Pam, if you'd bring up the timer. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we start with three minutes and members of the public, I do want to cut you off at three minutes. Um, so would you please tailor your comments to end uh, before that deadline? All right, Tara Laraha, why don't we bring you over? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please give us your name and your address. Yes, my name is Taryn Laraja and I live at 7 Strong Street. And I feel like I am in a, kind of a unique position to speak because I own a home in a neighborhood um, right in this in this. Um, I think it's the RG. Is that what, what we're in? Um, one of the the areas where you're where you're talking about making a change, and um, I also own a rental property that I rent to students on to, at two sixty five East Pleasant Street. It attaches our back backyards attach, and I also live next to um, a new neighbor who rents to students and who recently tried um, by a special permit to convert a garage. Um, to add another four students to the property and to pave over the backyard. And um, it just feels really, it, it's something I'm really worried about changing, not just for myself and our neighbors and our, our, you know, on Strong Street in East Pleasant, but 
in other downtown areas like this because what it, it just when it gets to a point where when there's a conversion um like this there there's no going back to that ever being a a family occupied home um i would never think about trying to put another building on the, the rental property that we have at two east at 265 east pleasant street it would really ruin the property and it would not be fair to <laughs> it just doesn't seem like it would be the right thing to do and um i mean i really feel like it's totally different when it's owner occupied and someone's putting like a unit for um oh i don't know a study or a you know in-law apartment but um to to just have students piled in to downtown um, we, we've already seen like a really big change. We have a lot more students in recent years and, you know, cars are everywhere. I mean, one of the things when you talk about density, it's like, why does there need to be a parking space for every student if the bus stop is across the street? And yet, you know, we're talking about that being a requirement, paving over backyards. And um, I, I just feel like it's it's a real concern and you know, I, I think, you know, I don't think we should kid ourselves that the, these are going to be, um, you know, for workers, um, they're going to be for students because students will pay much more. And I can tell you that from my own experience. Um, and, you know, it's different. I mean, I almost feel like it's owner occupied because we're right next door and, and we make that really clear to the students who are renting from us. Um, but I do think your idea about finding out what's working in other college towns and it, before making any kind of changes and allowing like I'm just about garage, upon garage to be converted to um, more student housing, I really think it's going to really destroy our neighborhoods in Amherst. And I hope you won't allow it. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Bruce Carson, why don't we bring Bruce over, Pam? Mm -hmm. And Bruce, if you'd give us your name and state your address, your street address. <clears throat> Hello, Bruce. Uh, you need to unmute. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. I'm Bruce Carson at 8 Strong Street. And uh, I just wanted to thank you all for your service. I served on the planning board in the past, so I know how much hard work there is. Uh, I just have a couple comments. One is uh, to concur with my neighbor, uh, Taryn LaRasha, that be careful about unintended consequences such as parking lots and backyards, uh, which really would change the whole character of a neighborhood. If you're going to add more converted dwellings or more units on what are often very small lots in the town center, the parking is a big issue. Uh, the other point is I don't believe that you could legislate the number of student units versus non-student. I, I, I believe from my time on the planning board that that's not possible legally, that, uh, that it would be considered discrimination. So I think when you create housing, it's for everybody. And, and as Terrence said, since students can pay more or their parents pay more, and that is the biggest market in town, I think that's going to remain so. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Also, I, I really agree with Ms. McGowan that design standards are so important uh, because, and I know what you're saying about single family homes aren't under those requirements, but you're talking about taking structures on existing lots that are not now used for housing and turning them into housing or adding housing on those lots, which does change the character of the neighborhood. And I think it's good to keep within that character by having design standards. So thank you. All right, thank you. Um, okay, and next is Jennifer Tao. Where did she, where did she uh, go? Did lose Jennifer? Looks like she took her hand down. So how about Elizabeth Veerling? Hello, Elizabeth. Uh, you can okay. unmute. Yes. There you yes. go. Yes, thank you. Yes, Elizabeth Veerling, 36 Cottage Street. 
So um, I have a number of things I wanted to say. Uh, first, uh, it should be abundantly clear to anyone who listens to the news that the housing crisis is not unique to Amherst, but it's a state and nationwide issue. However, what is unique to Amherst along with other college towns is the high student to permanent resident ratio, which has a major impact on our town in many ways. So I don't know the answer, uh, certainly by any means, but there need to be more targeted and creative ways to ensure that the Amherst student population does not dominate the town to the exclusion of permanent residents. Therefore, I really appreciate Bruce Colden's goals of understanding how successfully or unsuccessfully college towns have dealt with this issue. Um, I also wanted to mention that there's been the suggestion that shouldn't we want for climate change, et cetera, to have the students close in. But what about the 4,000 UMass staff who could be permanent residents here, but can't afford it? This is a population that's barely mentioned and that we should want to uh, facilitate to live close. Um, so I'm hardly a zoning or development expert, um, not by any stretch of the imagination, but the proposals as I can understand them seem to me like trickle down housing, analogous to trickle down economics, which I don't think is really viable. And that's why I think we need to have more creative um, ideas. So anyway, I hope that the focus can really be not just on changing zoning, but on developing approaches and programs so we might get what we really want and need, which is housing for permanent residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, next, I see John Varner's hand. We bring him over. Hello, John. Uh, you can unmute yourself and give us your name and street address. Yeah, I'm John Varner, <clears throat> 54 Jeffrey Lane. Uh, I actually went through uh, Mandy and Pat's proposal at length, uh, and it is uh, extremely complicated and full of a lot of dense verbiage and abbreviations, acronyms, et cetera, that make it a little difficult for people to actually focus. Uh, it's a very lengthy proposal. I wish it had been broken up into chunks and implemented again, uh, as people have uh, stated in, in pieces, uh, not uh, blanketing the whole town as, as the proposal is currently doing now. Uh, I don't think zoning should be uh, left up to any one individual. And I think the idea of taking categories of housing and putting them under the domain of a single individual is just gonna open the town up to, um, to litigation and um, with the butters of approved projects taking the town to court because it's been one person and not the zoning board that has changed the uh, the regulations, I think zoning is a contract between citizens and the town, and it should not be changed uh, in a willy nilly fashion. Um, but moving on, uh, there are communities across the country, and I've talked at length with the zoning commissioner of State College, Pennsylvania, where Penn State is located. Uh, they track student housing as a specific category. Uh, it is not a constitutional issue for them. Uh, I don't know if Massachusetts is uh, somehow different, but it works in some jurisdictions. Uh, I don't know how the town is currently tracking economic and social segregation and which properties are currently student occupied. I know they are not doing that. And I think that getting data like that is essential to addressing the problems that you're trying to address. Students are always gonna be competing with people of modest means uh, for rental housing and the fees that rental houses in uh, Amherst get are gonna be interlocked with the fees that UMass charges for uh, dormitories. And I don't understand how um, these proposals are going to change that dynamic. Um, there uh, are supposed to be uh, multiple choice places for home ownership opportunities. Sounds lofty, but um, does this create housing for people of lower moderate income in Amherst subscale areas? Does it encourage the uh, affluent to move into affordable apartment complexes? Does this predom or does this predominantly create home ownership opportunities for uh, people who are investors and <laughs> who uh, expand their uh, investment. Now you have 30 seconds left. Right. Dormitories are more sustainable than apartments. I don't know why dormitories are not brought into this uh, with their common spaces, hallways, laundries, eating facilities, bathrooms, uh, all being shared. They're much more economic, much more environmentally sensitive. And that seems to be a big push in this uh, proposal, environmental sensitivity. And I think that that would be a better use of uh, real estate and resources. 
Uh, and finally, is there a community outside the Rust Belt where real estate uh, prices have actually decreased recently? I don't think so. And I don't think any proposal that's on the board is going to do that. Uh, I have more to say, but All right. I'll there. and uh, more comments will probably appear in the Amherst Indy uh, for reference. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Janet Keller. Hello, Janet. <laughs> Give us your name and your street address. You can unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Janet Keller. I live at 120 Pulpit Hill Road up in North Amherst. And um, I want to join the crew that is urging you to be very careful and uh, prudent in keeping design standards. Um, it's, uh, they're much more important to our well-being than, than we give them credit for. Uh, I also want to put in a strong plea for uh, putting a butter notices back in for all of these projects. Um, they, it's a tiny little bit of the cost of the application for the proponent, and it's critical um, for uh, abutters often know more about the area um, and what's going on and can point things out. And um, I, I think it's really very important. Um, I, um, Let's see. Um, I think Tom's idea about getting data and models is incredibly important. And um, uh, it, zoning is just a, a, a bunch of words to most people. And having those uh, uh, requiring those kinds of, uh, of illustrations before something is decided and before it's too late um, to change something that would be a mistake, I think is critically important. And I appreciate um, the care that, uh, that you folks have devoted to this discussion and um, appreciate the opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the last hand from public I see is Jennifer Tao. We'd bring her over and Jennifer, if you'd give us your street address. Okay, thank you. I didn't, didn't... Uh, we cannot hear you very well. Can you hear me now? A little bit better, yeah. Yeah, it's still a little bit quiet, but go ahead. Uh, let me, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's pretty good. Not too loud, I hope. Nope. Okay, um, thank, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Jennifer Taub. I live at 259 Lincoln Avenue. And I did, I have a comment and a kind of a clarification because what I heard is that you would like, your, the suggestion is has been made to begin in the RG and the RVCs. But in the RG district where I live and you know who I represent, um, you can already have duplexes, triplexes, and townhouses. So that is not a big, is not a change. Um, and we don't really need to do a pilot to see what happens with those duplexes, triplexes, and townhouses, because it's been happening for years. And those multifamily housing are overwhelmingly rented to students and they're expensive student rentals at, at that. So by way of an example, just this afternoon, I mean, Bruce was there because he's also a member of the local historic district commission. Um, the owner of a property on Fearing Street, what's basically a single family house there, it was a single family house for years, then it was converted into a triplex to be rented to students, not really a very a huge lot. They're now proposing to add three, four bedroom units to that lot, plus the three units in the front house, so they could have 36 students living there. And they, they were very open about the fact those are all for students. So we, again, you know, we don't have to see what will happen because it's already happening. And 
I personally don't think it's the responsibility of the town of Amherst to house all the students that need and want to live off campus and to specifically ask the RGs to continue to be the districts that absorb even more students is really targeting one district to bear the burden of what, you know, understandably other parts of town want to avoid. And if you're asking the RG to absorb all these zoning changes, and again, you know, duplexes, triplexes, and townhouses are already permitted here, but to combine that with relaxing the permitting standards is really creating an untenable situation. And that we just had um, a townhouse complex, it's uh, in the process of being constructed on Fearing and Sunset in the RG, and it made an enormous difference to the community that that applicant had to go through before the Zoning Board of Appeal and through the special permitting process. And it would be, I, I just don't see any reason for relaxing the permitting uh, process and the regulatory standards, but to combine that with accelerating development is a double whammy that really no district should be- 15 active. seconds left. Okay, I would also ask, I understand that planning department is understaffed, but I think that these zoning changes being proposed are so sweeping that we should do everything we can to heed Janet's suggestion um, that we see drawings and a build out before we adopt. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next hand is from Pam Rooney. <coughs> Bring her over. Hello, Pam. If you give us your name and your street address. Hi, this is Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, the previous speaker actually covered a lot of what I was going to say. I think the RG has been the has has borne the brunt of of a lot of the absorption of extra housing in town. Uh, when I was walking around with campaign brochures, I was astounded by the number of converted dwellings within the RG that exists today. Um, I need to ask a very direct question, and that is why, if someone could tell me why it is the responsibility of the town of Amherst to house the increasingly, uh, the increasing number of UMass students who can no longer find homes on the campus. Why is it the responsibility? I think I think Chairman Marshall said this, but why is it our responsibility to absorb this increase? We have no control over the increase of the enrollment, and for years, so between between the year 2000 and the year 2020, there were at least an additional 8,000 students added to the rolls not counting university without walls not not you know not counting the people who only worked online it was it was over 8000 students that were added that the town and the surrounding communities end up having to absorb please tell me why we especially in the RG are responsible for absorbing them i think the the folks who come forward to propose housing and dwelling units in town um, seem to succeed. If they want to convert something, they seem to be able to do that. If they want to create townhouses at key intersections near the near the campus, they seem to be able to do that. I, I really don't understand the, the need to relax the permitting structure to allow that to happen. So thank you for your in-depth and consideration of, of this question and, and this issue for the town. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, I will point out, I think, I believe Pam is the liaison to the planning board from the town council. Uh, let's bring our last hand over. That's Dorothy Pam. Uh, Dorothy, if you'd give us your name and your address. Hi, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street, right in the middle of the RG. Um, 
I just want to second many of the good comments from uh, both on the planning board and from the public. Um, I'm just commenting on a complete disconnect between the social and economic goals, which are clearly and poignantly stated in this zoning proposal, because none of these suggestions will in fact result in um, people being able a uh, social justice or minorities buying homes or being able to afford the rent or for workforce housing. And I, I am truthfully very confused. Why is there so little concern for the workforce housing? If you want to talk about who should live nearby, so many people in the neighborhood live work for the university in one way or the other or retired from the university. And there's a great need for housing that people who work for the university can afford who because not everybody gets a big salary. Um, and, um, you know, we do have student housing that is successful in our RG, and that is mostly in the houses of owner occupied housing. Those students are integrated into our community, come to our brunches and don't cause any problems. In fact, create a lot of um, help us out with our computers and um, you know, give liveliness to the neighborhood. So we, we like having young people in the neighborhood, both families with children, and we like having students, but not in the way that's being proposed now, which is a pure profit giveaway for developers who are gonna charge everything they can charge. And the students then, because they're paying such crazy rents for so little space, uh, are you know breaking the, um, the limit as to how many people can be in there. And you know, Pam Rooney mentioned, key intersections. We were told that we might be getting townhouses at the key intersections, but the proposal that uh, Jennifer Tao was just mentioning is in the middle of a block. It's in the middle of an, a residential block abutting many, many lawns of private houses. So it seems to us that there's a complete disconnect between the goals of, of what we're supposed to be doing, preserving a neighborhood and housing people connected to the university and housing students in good, safe housing and, and this proposal. So I, I am um, very disappointed with it because there obviously are some changes that we should make. And I double support that the ZBA has been an extremely helpful board in making uh, a, a conversation, leading a conversation between the developer and the surrounding community so that we can coexist with a certain amount of um, happiness or acceptance. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Or, sorry, thank you, Dorothy. That's okay, that's okay. All right, uh, that was the last hand from the public. And Bruce, we can go back to you. You've had your hand up for a while. Yes, uh, I, I uh, um, Mr. Carlson said uh, that he felt that uh, students were a protected category, uh, presumably under the Fair Housing Act, and I believe he is wrong. Um, I think we can do all that has been suggested, and we should not uh, uh, pay any attention to that particular piece of what he had to offer tonight. Uh, um, does anybody know that I'm wrong on that? I have heard the same thing, so I cannot uh, contradict you, Bruce. They are not, they are not a pr protected class from a discrimination point of view. Correct. We've, we, we, we deal with this uh, consistently when we're selling houses in our co-housing community because we are very concerned and about people valuing community. And we've established that uh, certain things are protected and certain things aren't and we've uh, for many years have been paying very close attention to that and uh, which is why i'm heading out on my little job because uh, being able to identify a student home as a as a as a use is uh, wouldn't be possible if um, if if mr carlson was correct and if he was correct i wouldn't be i wouldn't have even begun to do what i'm doing all right thank you bruce so it's now eight o'clock. We usually take a break at this time. Um, I don't see any other hands up and I'm wondering whether we might consider closing our conversation for this evening on this topic and move on to the rest of our agenda after we come back. Uh, so uh, uh, I was gonna give you five minutes to think about, <laughs> excuse me, to think about that. Um, and then we can continue or not uh, when we come back at 5.8.06. Why don't we do that? So mute yourself and turn off your camera and we'll see you at 8.06.
Thank you.
All right, the time is 8.06, at least on my clock. I'm seeing people come back. Great. <coughs> Looks like we're still missing Bruce. Mr. Marshall, it also looks like it's, has Karin left? Yes, it does look that way, yep. Okay, so I'm gonna note that she left right when yeah, the break right around, started. Right around eight o'clock. Okay. All right, there's Bruce, so we're all back. All right, so uh, any objections to ending this conversation for this evening about the zoning amendments? Janet? I don't have an objection, but I wondered like about next steps. Like part of me was sort of thinking with some dread about like, do we need a chart to look at like ADUs, dupli different types of duplexes, like how they're handled, who does it, what the standards are, and then what it would look like with the changes. Like those kind of comparisons would be useful to people. Um, and then I just wonder, like, I also think this is a great setup for our conversation next Tuesday, which is, you know, increasing density in the village centers, which I must cheerfully say is what the master plan calls for and how we do that. And so, you know, adding a lot of students to the RG or loosening the um, kind of gatekeeper on that, um, that neighborhood is obviously under huge pressure. And we just hear that over and over again. And so, you know, you know, I think about the RO and RLD as sensitive lands that we want to control density on for ecological reasons, you know, all sorts of good reasons. Um, and I wonder if we should look at the RG that way as a neighborhood that's really under tremendous pressure. And instead of making it easier to just not, like we should think of that as a sensitive neighborhood where there's a lot of forces at play and maybe focus and channel the um, density towards the village centers where we let more density and higher buildings and more walkable and bus stops and children holding hands, you know. Well, the, R the RG is larger than the fearing Lincoln neighborhood. I mean, I, I think I live in the RG and uh, I don't think I'm feeling the pressure that they do uh, necessarily. Uh, well, I... the, the pressure is mostly because of the geographic existence of that space uh, kind of between downtown and UMass. Um, so it's not like the rest of us are trying to, you know, destroy them. Um, but it, it's, it's, when I, it's the old location, location, location. But I see the same impacts on Shumway Street, South Whitney, Main Street towards Amherst. I mean, you know, it's it's a lot of, there's a lot of transition than even in the 20 years I've lived here in those very small streets between Main Street and Route 9, you know, they frankly look junkier and junkier and there's more and more cars. And so I don't think, I think that spillover effect is in a lot of neighborhoods. And so do we let that keep happening? Um, and do we make that easier to happen without, you know, design controls and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, you know, I think it's something to talk about maybe on Tuesday. In kind of a more holistic way. Okay, uh, Bruce. Um, yes, uh, both Dorothy and Jennifer mentioning that uh, thing that we were shown this afternoon at the uh, local historic district commission hearing. It wasn't a hearing; it was an informational meeting, uh, uh, and uh, it was, as was said, uh, a house on Fearing, which has become uh, renovated as a triplex, and then in the backyard were proposing not one, not two, but three additional duplexes. Um, and while we were on break, I thought, wow, I've just said that I'm comfortable with uh, duplexes as a by right. And then, uh, Chris, I'm wondering, I mean, uh, could that mean that if, if, if we were to elevate duplexes to a by right, which is what's supposed, that that project that's proposed on Fearing Street uh, which has got multiple duplexes on the same lot, would that be, would, would, would I be supporting that as a by right uh, entitlement? Uh, Chris, uh, I see your hand. Because certainly uh, it's not what I'm, not what I'm intending. Well, the other zoning regulations still apply. 
You still yes, have they... to meet lot area and building area requirements. But I believe that Bruce is right. I think that that would be allowed by right because it, it, it would be a non-owner occupied duplex um, as defined by this proposal. So um, Nate was at the meeting. He's here now. He may want to say something, but in my opinion, um, that would be allowed by right. And I do think that that's kind of a bridge too far, in my opinion, again. Way too far. You, you, yours, I commend you. You should all have a look at this damn thing. It's, I mean, it's designed by Chad Roberts. He's not a silly man. But take a look. Well, I wouldn't know where to find it, Bruce. Oh, I mean, it'll it'll show up. When, be ready for it when it comes. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll keep looking at the Gazette. At the Gazette, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, if people don't have more to say, maybe we can move on from that topic. Uh, the time now is eight twelve, and we'll go on with the next item on our agenda, which I believe is old business. Uh, Chris, the first thing on the list here is legal ad fees. Uh, what would you like to say about that? So my, my mind is getting a little fuzzy um, recently because I've had too many things in it, but I don't think I've talked to you recently about legal ad fees. Is that correct? I talked to Doug, but I don't think I've talked to the rest of the planet. No, I don't think you have either. Um, so last June, the planning board we brought a topic to the planning board, the staff did. And the topic we brought was the fact that we were going way over our allotment for spending money on legal ads. And um, <clears throat> the average price of a legal ad for uh, you know, an application has gone way up. It used to be you know, in the neighborhood of 150 to maybe $300. And, and recently it's been um, more like six or $700. And recently it's gotten even more expensive than that. But we brought the topic to the planning board um, in hopes that the planning board would agree to raising the legal ad fee from what it had been, which was $75, up to $300. And um, the, we felt that the $300 would cover half of the legal ad and that um, the town would cover the rest of it. And, and we were um, satisfied with that. Um, but the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, they wanted to uh, get into um, this topic as well, and they had discussions about it, and they um, also voted to raise their legal ad fee to $300, but they weren't really comfortable with that. They wanted to have a, a tiered approach to the legal ad fee, and they felt that they had some um, applications that were for owner occupied houses that you know wanted to expand a nonconformity or something like that and that those should have a lower fee and that um, things like you know what has been described in this conversation um, the the Barry Roberts project on Sunset Ave which is I think going to have 17 units you know maybe that project should have a uh, legal ad fee that's closer to what the actual fee is, maybe that should be $500. So anyway, the the um, zoning board initiated this conversation uh, at its February 9th meeting. And um, I had spoken to Doug in sometime in the last few weeks about this topic and that the zoning board wanted to um, kind of try to have a meeting of the minds with the planning board and reach some agreement about, you know, lower a lower fee for things that are small and a higher fee for things that are larger. Um, personally, I feel that that's too complicated and it, leads, it may leave it up to staff to determine whether something's um, a lower level project or a more complicated project. Sometimes it's clear, but sometimes it isn't clear. So I'd prefer to stick with the $300 fee. Anyway, when the zoning board discussed this last week, they decided that it wasn't, and I, ex I explained to them that the planning board doesn't really have that many small projects that come along. The planning board is mostly dealing with larger things. And occasionally you do make a recommendation to the zoning board about you know, a duplex, 
or you made a recommendation about um, a project on North Pleasant Street, which involved putting a single family home on a site that already had a duplex. So you, you do those kinds of things, <coughs> those recommendations, but you, that doesn't require a legal ad. So the zoning board um, kind of backed off and they said, okay, well, we'll have our own discussion about this and we'll decide what we wanna do about our legal ad fees. And we'll let the planning board make their own determination. So I'm just bringing this to you to tell you that this conversation is going on. And I guess to ask you if you feel that there's a need to re-examine our legal ad fees or are you okay with a flat $300 for everybody, which in my mind is the simplest way to go. And it's also more fair than what we had in the past, which was the $75 fee, so. Well, Chris, you've talked to me and I've already told you, but I'll share with the board. I, I'm fine with the $300, I, I support that. Uh, Bruce. Uh, question, uh, Chris, how did the uh, folks on Spalding Avenue, which is the smallest project that we've had since I've been there, was, uh, did they kick the $300? They have, they had the $300 fee, yeah. Okay, so this seems fine. Uh, Janet. Um, I have a question. So, you know, I think the smallest projects we have had are those ATM things. Chris, do people have to do an ad when they come back to us, like with a lighting plan or a sign change or, you know, um, do they have to do a legal ad for that when they need to come back? May I answer that? Yes, Chris. Um, no, they don't need to come back if they're coming back to um, say that they met a certain condition. Um, the only thing they we need to have legal ads for is for public hearings. So uh, that would be a public meeting, what you were describing, Janet. So that would not require a legal ad. Um, and and am I, ATMs. And am, I, am I right, Chris, that the legal ad occurs when we are going to open the public hearing? That's if, correct. If we yes. continue it, however many times we continue it, we don't do additional ads. No. And small projects like an ATM, like Janet mentioned, that's, you know, Greenfield Savings Bank, they can afford $300. So even though it's a small project, you know, it's a, it's a corporation that's um, proposing this thing. I mean, I'm, a part of my perspective was off, you know, if somebody's proposing to make some modification that allows them to add a rental unit to their house, you know, they're gonna get $1,500, $2,000 a month for that forever. And $300 is just not that much in terms of the total expenditure they're gonna to have to go through to build the thing. And then in terms of the revenue they're gonna get. So I'm, I'm not particularly uh, receptive to reducing it for, for single family conversations like that. Um, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I'm fine with 300 as well. Did we, I feel like when we talked about this maybe last year or two years ago, we had said just have the applicant pay for everything, right? Does that ring a bell or am I misremembering? And then I we, guess- We bounced around. We, I think the conversation went back and forth. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we ended up at 300 just as a compromise with some of the people who didn't want to impose a set six or $700. The other thing is that uh, staff doesn't always know how much it's gonna cost upfront when the person comes in for their application. So, you know, the timing is difficult. You know, you want the fee at the, at the start so that you can go and get the notice and you don't know what it is. Chris? Yeah. So the um, Conservation Commission requires that their applicants pay for the legal ad. And they do spend time chasing that and they have to keep track of it. And um, they also only have to advertise once. So their legal ads are about half as much as ours are. Their rate, there's range between two and $300, I think. Um, so I just feel like it's an extra burden on staff to chase them, to get them to pay the legal ad fee. And if you require them to do it by themselves, then um, you're not sure that it's actually going to happen or that it's going to happen on time and time for the public hearing. So um, we like to control things and make sure that, yes, the legal ad has been placed 
you know, yes, the, the all the notices have gone out correctly and all that. So we want to take that on ourselves. We don't want the applicant to be responsible for that. And um, if we place a legal ad and then we have to chase the applicant to help to get them to pay for it, it's just too much complication, too much extra work for us. So and that's kind of where we're coming from. Thanks, Chris. Bruce? Um, Doug, I, I agree with you when we're talking about the uh, smaller uh, folks who might want to add a rental unit uh, um, and they they have a public hearing to, to for the addition. But uh, am I right that once you are in that loop and you want to make changes down the line, you know, if you want to the, uh, put a ramp in, for example, then uh, because you're part of a special permit process, uh, you can't just get a permit for the ramp. You have to come back to another public hearing. So it's quite possible that uh, these smaller uh, applicants uh, for subsequent uh, events like that would probably be finding that these uh, larger numbers would be maybe difficult to, or would be onerous. Uh, you, so, yeah, I, right. I, and I think the, the planning, I can see why the zoning board therefore is going to want to do that. And but if, if, if it's very unusual for us, uh, then, uh, except it won't be if we, if the zoning changes go through and we suddenly find ourselves uh, dealing with a lot of uh, duplex uh, permits, so forth. So maybe we'll do it then. But, but I'm, I just want to bear in mind that once you're in this loop and you want to do small things in the future, then you're still generating all these never-ending public meetings. Yeah, that's a good point. That actually, I think I mentioned that when Chris and I talked that, you know, maybe we should be making a whole lot more things in town by right so that you don't have to get into this loop and require the public hearing and the legal ad and all that stuff. So, I mean, that relates to obviously what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, and that's why I'm part of the reason why I support the buy right on the duplexes. Uh, and then had a horror pit when I realized that I was supporting something like 98 fearing. Okay. All right. Um, Chris, I guess I'm not seeing a groundswell of consensus to change the current policy that this board has. Um, and as I understand it, it's okay for our board to have one fee and the zoning board to have a different structure for their fees. So I guess I we're so. okay for now. Okay, good, thank you. All right, the time is 824. Is there any other <laughs> old business? I don't think so. All right, do we have any new business? Not that I'm aware of. All right. Uh, form A, A and R subdivision applications. No. None. Okay. ZBA applications. Oh my goodness. I wasn't in the loop, Chris. You're yeah, in the I'm loop. Not in the loop. So I was too busy to be in that loop. I can tell you what they are. If I can find my sheet. Let's see here. I think I've told you about some of them already. Um, 290 and 300 West Street. One of them is a duplex that already exists. And one is a duplex that's proposed. Um, they're along West Street, just south of Crocker Farm School. Um, there's nothing particularly remarkable about either one of them. And those are coming before the planning board on ZBA? March 9th. Um, planning board or ZBA? Z Excuse me, ZBA. ZBA. I'm getting everybody confused. <laughs> ZBA. I'm, I'm ZBA now, as well as being planning board. So I'm, things are starting to mix together in my mind. Anyway, I think we told you about that a while ago. Um, what happened was it was originally advertised for a certain date and the um, the notice wasn't uh, posted on the town website in a timely manner, so we had to re-advertise it. Anyway, um, the next one is Canton Ave, and that's really just a public hearing. Um, there's a development on Canton Ave at the very end, if anybody knows where 
uh, Julius Fabos lived. Um, he's passed away since, but in any, any event, he had a big piece of property at the very end of the road, and he's and his family sold that property, and they created two flag lots, and one of the flag lots has a special permit to allow a house to be built there, and um, that house is coming to the ZBA to change the exact location of the house, but I don't think that's a big enough thing for the planning board to be particularly interested in. And anyway, it's not a public hearing, it's just a public meeting. But if you're interested, I can tell you more about it. That's coming back to the planning board on March 23rd. ZBA. Excuse me, ZBA. <laughs> These are all ZBA. You're here to straighten me out. Mm -hmm. um, 515 Sunderland Road. This is an interesting one. Um, it's a proposal to put um, battery storage on a property, um, it used to be Annie's Garden Center, um, and it's been owned by the Chang family for a number of years. It's right up near the uh, border with Sunderland, and they're going to be putting um, a large amount of battery storage, standalone battery storage up there. And it's gone through the Conservation Commission. Conservation Commission has scrutinized it, and now it's coming to the CBA. Um, that may be something that you want to look at. It's coming on to the ZBA on March 23rd. You interested in having a um, presentation about that one? Um, at the moment, I'm not seeing any hands. Okay. Janet, you're on the solar bylaw working group. Do you yeah, think I we would... can look at this? Well, I, I think it's super important, but I wonder if the presentation should be to the solar bylaw working group, because we've been looking at some of those issues around batteries, exciting issues around batteries, I'll say, as a euphemistic um, thing. So I, I bet that's there's not no, up. there's no, um, what should I say, there's no permitting path that would um, require that they go to the solar bylaw working group, it would be a courtesy on their yeah. part. Um, and but there is a permitting path for the, having them come to the planning board because the planning board can be called upon to make recommendations to the CBA on special permits. So um, oh, maybe I'll mention it to the other board. Um, Chris, can I ask you a quick question about the first duplex on West Street? Like, what's the? There's an existing duplex, and are they changing something, or is it just are they? Is yeah, it, the existing duplex. Um, the people who own both properties they're different llc's but they're you know basically the same people um and they are taking a chunk of land away from the 290 west street to give oh. to 300 west street in order to allow 300 west street to become a duplex so mm -hmm. that's really the change that's happening on 290 west street it's nothing about the use okay um, thank you okay All right. All right. And then um, the spoke um, is the spoke, as you probably know, it took over that building that used to have um, the copy shop and it also used to have a sub shop and pizza place. And anyway, now they have that whole building on East Pleasant Street um, and they are proposing a nightclub um, on Prey Street in a former build in the building that was formerly Old Town Tavern. Yeah, and, um, and the laundromat. And the laundromat, yeah. Uh, is yeah. That the laundromat? Yeah, when all, it, I mean, at least that building at the opposite end is the laundromat. And it had the dry cleaners. I think that uh, Old Town Tavern may be a standalone building. No, it's no, one long, no. I mean, it's one long structure. Maybe it's a firewall, but it's one long structure. Okay. And it's all, you know, it's all vacant at this point. So anyway, the spoke is um, going to establish something called live at the spoke in that location, and it's going to be a nightclub, and it's going to be run by the same people who are running the, the spoke on East Pleasant Street. Um, there really aren't too many site changes. I think they're going to be putting two sheds um, behind the building to house some of their equipment. They're gonna be putting a fence up along the west side of the property. Um, other than that, they were really not changing much on the property, but 
it's an interesting use. So any okay. interest in seeing that one? Not seeing any hands. Andrew. I mean, for my my own curiosity, I would I would like to know more about it, but I don't want to drag the board through it. I guess I guess we could all listen into the ZBA meeting. That's right. Yep. You yeah. can do that. No, that's, yep. that's that's reasonable. So that's going to be heard by the ZBA on April 13th if you're interested in tuning in. Okay. And those are um let's see, what else do we have? I think I might have told you about some of these other ones already. So I won't bother with those. Okay. All set? All righty, that's good. Yep. Okay, then we'll move on. Uh, the time is 8.30. <laughs> Excuse me, 8.32. Any upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Pam just put something into um, our system. What did you put in there, Pam? Um, I put in, I didn't really put it in, um, but it's at Amherst College at the Book and Plow. That's right. Amherst College is building a little outdoor the gathering building. place and they are going to have an accompanying outdoor restroom of some sort, I believe. So um, that's coming to you. And I'm trying to think there there have been a lot of people in here talking to us about different things, but nothing has yet gelled. So okay. All right. All right. Uh, board and committee liaison reports. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Bruce, have you actually started attending? I believe. Well, uh, you have, you, have you got your drum, drum kit there, uh, Doug? You could, uh, and Andrew, if you were near a symbol or something. If you could. Yes, uh, I actually uh, have been confirmed. I have, uh, thank you all. I have uh, attended my first meeting. Um, First of all, it's kind of overwhelming. I mean, it's like uh, it's, it's it's like a checkerboard. Your Zoom call that looks like a Chuck Close painting. Mm -hmm. um, at the uh, um, at the the, uh, the the news is that uh, they reviewed their budget and uh, 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 and uh, I think it that was largely it. There was a couple. Oh, there was a. a um, uh, a presentation um, related to oh goodness me I'm such a dimwit I sorry just let me let me do this properly I clearly have to get better practice at this uh, um, so that I can be more like Janet when I'm talking to this topic um, <laughs> uh, there was a strategic planning uh, scoping seminar um, there. Uh, looking at uh, uh, this thing called the Consensus Building Institute. And uh, basically, it's um, uh, uh, preliminary to a, uh, a, a plan, uh, an assessment plan, a strategic plan for the, uh, for the organization. And, and that was uh, the, the approach to that was presented. But uh, that, I think, is, is all. Any questions? Good, thank you. All right, we'll move on. <laughs> and, Andrew, keep seat back. No updates. Okay, Tom, DRB. No, just an update that Chris now has more on her plate and is now in charge of the DRB meetings as well. <laughs> so I look forward to working with Chris um, until she has someone to take this burden from her. Okay. But we have a meeting coming up um, in the next couple of weeks. All right. Uh, Janet, solar bylaw. Um, I don't really have much of an update, and I was um, we worked a little about a, we worked on a small section of the solar bylaw, and it completely eludes me what it was. And I was hoping Chris would help remind me, but I, I think I don't want to ask her. <laughs> okay. It was, it was kind I was of working on it today, so I could tell you. Oh, good, because it was one like that it was, we worked on the last time had to do with monitoring and maintenance and decommissioning and abandonment and all of those things. So um, that's what we worked on last time. I think we're going to go over that again on Friday. And then we are also going to be talking about submittal requirements on Friday. Okay. And then um, the other thing about the decommissioning, which I'm sort of interested in, is 
the question, it doesn't seem like there's been people pretty much use the solar bylaw, the, so, the facilities, and it's not clear people really would be decomm decommissioning them because they're so valuable. Like you would just swap in new panels and stuff like that. So um, that was just kind of, we spent a lot of time on that. And I was kind of like, is this going to happen? You know, kind of, it's just going to stay a solar facility for decades and things like that, but obviously important. I'm not going to minimize it, but okay. that's it. Thanks, Janet. C uh, Chris, CRC. So CRC has been working on the rental registration. They've also been working on a nuisance house bylaw. And this coming Thursday, tomorrow, they're going to be uh, con maybe coming to a conclusion about the rental registration. And then they're also going to be having an initial discussion about this zoning amendment that you've been talking about. So they will be holding a public hearing on March 2nd, but they're getting their introduction to this tomorrow at 4.30. So if you want to tune in and hear what they have to say about it, you you will be welcome to attend. And that, that that's followed by a zoning board meeting, I believe. So that's right. And I'll you be can there. fill up your whole afternoon and evening <laughs> with town <laughs> events. Mm -hmm. OK, all right. Uh, I don't have any report uh, other than to say I'm looking forward to seeing all of you next Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the town room. And um, we'll have, I think, two hours is the plan to just stand around a map and talk about where we where we think people might accept more housing and what kind of housing that might be. Um, so, uh, Chris, anything from report of staff? Just to say thank you so much to Nate and Pam for their hard work in the re in recent weeks. It's been um, challenging, but we're managing to keep our heads above water. And so far, we haven't gotten into any bad trouble. We've gotten into a how are, how are you doing on <laughs> on hiring additional staff? We have second interviews for two um, two individuals that we're hoping will pan out. Yep. Okay, good. All right. Um, Unless anybody has anything else, time is 8.39 and I think we can adjourn. Thank you all for sticking it out tonight. Tom, uh, Thanks, uh, go, go to bed, Tom. I'm gonna be strong too. Okay, bye-bye. Get better. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Stop recording, are you sure? Stop recording.